Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to the webinar on the new NX3 and NX15. And let's see here. I'm Chuck Kelly, Director of Sales for Nautel, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Alex Morash, the AM Project Team Leader. Good morning or good afternoon, Alex. Hey, Chuck. How's it going? I'm just great and, and excited to be here for this webinar. Alex is the is the team leader of all of the engineers that are involved in the NX series. And on this project, uh, I think there was like seven, seven broadcast engineers or, or electrical engineers that were a part of this. Is that right, Alex? Yeah, that's about right. Yep, and between yourself and Tim Hardy, uh, head of engineering from Nautel, uh, you're the fathers of, uh, of the NX series at Nautel. I suppose you could say that, yeah. That's a pretty good thing to be. Uh, uh, anyway, the things we're going to talk about here today are uh, the introduction of the NX3 and the 15. We actually introduced the, these products at the NAB. These are things that people have been asking for for a long time. We're going to go through an overview of the series. And we're going to talk about their digital compatibility. A key feature is the efficiency. We're going to talk about the control and the advanced capabilities. And as always, the most popular part of the whole webinar, we're going to actually go on, log on to a, 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 an X3 that you've got down in the engineering lab through the AUI and live walk through it. That's a live tour. We talk a little bit about Nautel support. And at the very end, we're going to actually take your questions. So you'll notice on the, on the tool that you've got for the go-to webinar, uh, that you're, you're logged into right now, that there's a place for you to ask questions. And I would recommend that uh, any time you want, you can go ahead and go in there and, and ask questions. Um, and, and at the very end of the webinar, Alex and I will endeavor to answer as many of the questions as we receive. So uh, please do not uh, be shy. Do ask questions. If we can't answer all of the web, uh, webinar questions, during the actual webinar, uh, bear in mind that we will uh, answer the rest of them by email. So without any further ado, let's press on. And so um, this is the world that we have today. And when we start talking about low power AM transmitters, there's all kinds of stuff in the market today from, from old tube type or valve type transmitters to the newer solid state transmitters, but even them, there's a massive difference in the efficiency and the feature set and the digital compatibility of those older transmitters today. And, and, and actually, if you look at the transmitters on the market today, apart from Nautel, there's very, very little new development, new designs, new products. Um, I, I think one of the things that's most exciting about these products is how they really lead the industry in terms of technology. Um, nobody else is really putting a lot of research and development into new AM transmitters today. Would you agree to that, Alex? I think that's I think that's correct. So anyway, and the, and the picture in the lower right-hand corner is one of my favorites. So it's n probably not quite that bad in 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 most stations, but. Maybe not too far away from it. Uh, so the NX3 and the NX15 are the latest in a proud line of high-performance, high-efficiency AM transmitters that now extends from 3 kilowatts to 2 megawatts. Uh, we have over 20 million watts of NX transmitters now deployed in the field, and uh, they're very efficient, industry-leading efficiency. They're very compact. We're going to talk about all of these things. Um, uh, the AUI makes them very advanced, and the digital compatibility is um, unparalleled. So the, the whole line is there. You'll see that the NX3 is in the same box configuration. It shares a lot of the hardware with the NX5 and the NX10, and then the X, NX15 is sharing a lot of the same attributes physically as the NX25. Um, and they both, they both offer a broad range of features that we're going to go into in much greater detail later in the webinar. Uh, just for purposes of, of rough uh, evaluation in terms of size, um, the, uh, the NX series at these power levels is much smaller than the competitive products out there. Um, so you can end up oftentimes making a little bit of space next to your existing transmitter, putting the new NX series in, and leaving the other one as a backup, should that ever be needed. Um, and you still end up with plenty of room in your transmitter building. So this is basically the way an NX low power is uh, is uh, is laid out. Uh, Alex, you want to walk us through this diagram? 
Uh, sure, yeah. So um, basically, uh, you have your audio inputs coming in, and we, we accept AES or analog, um, or also IQ over AES for DRM transmissions. Um, mm -hmm. And then that goes through the control that's board. Unique, and that's unique too, isn't it? I, most other organizations require you to put mag and phase. Mag and phase, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that goes through our control board and into the DSP, um, or sorry, into the exciter, which has a DSP mm -hmm. and an FPGA on mm -hmm. it, um, mm -hmm. which generate the RF drive and, and the magnitude signals that are used to um, derive the power amplifiers in the, in the mm -hmm. transmitter. Mm -hmm. um, so our power amplifiers are two and a half kilowatt blocks, and they are series combined at the output. Right. And then the output of that combiner goes through um, a matching network, which is also a filtering network. Um, and from there, we get their filtered output. Uh, from the and, and the B plus that drives the the PAs is approximately 400 volts before it hits the modulator, right? Yeah, that's correct. So are we, the, there's a mains transformer at the front end where the AC gets connected to. Um, that converts the incoming mains to 320 volts AC. Mm -hmm. um, and then the phase controlled rectifier converts that to a 400 volt DC bus. And that gives a soft start. Uh, that's right, yeah. So it, it, when you turn the transmitter on, it, it, it's, it ramps up the 400 volts DC so you don't get a, a step function there, basically. And in the 3 kilowatt, there's just two modules. But in the 15 kilowatt, there's? There's uh, 10 modules in the 15 kilowatt. Modules. Very good. All right. And let's talk about dynamic pre-correction. Um, this is a really interesting drawing, and we've used it before. But I kind of want to walk through this a little bit and make sure everybody understands what all these bo gray boxes means. Sure. OK. Um, so essentially what pre-correction is doing is it's uh, comparing the, the output signal from the transmitter uh, to what it thinks the ideal signal should be, and then um, uh, Creating correction curves that try to make try to adapt the input signal to make the output signal look ideal. Um, so okay. this this um, diagram is showing a directional coupler at the output, um, mm -hmm. and that's where our sample comes from. And so it's an RF sample coming back to an analog to digital converter. Right, mm -hmm. um, and that gets um, demodulated so that we, we're just dealing with the baseband modulation signal. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we compared that to a delayed version of the input signal um, right. and generate an error signal, which is right. the difference between the input and the output. Right. And then that goes through an adaption algorithm that um, generates the adaption curves that are applied, then applied to the input signal. Um, okay. And that LUT is just lookup table. It's real simple. That's right, yeah. Okay, so that then creates the error term, and it and basically what we're correcting for is AM to AM envelope equalization and AM to PM. Right. So okay. AM to, AM to AM is uh, amplitude um, nonlinearities. Mm -hmm. um, so so your output amplitude doesn't exactly match your input amplitude. Uh, mm -hmm. AM AM to PM is a is a phase non nonlinearity. Um, and then envelope equalization is basically frequency response to the transmitter. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, and, and here's where the rubber hits the road. Used to be that PWM transmitters were really cool, but they had a, a problem that was affectionately known within the broadcast engineering community as PWM nipple. And, they, and the bottom line is it, as you would approach minus 100% modulation, uh, or cutoff, uh, just before you reach that, it would automatically slide down to 100% cutoff, mm -hmm. and and you'd end up with some distortion uh, when you're when you're modulating heavily. Right. That's gone now. That's right. Yeah. So that's what this figure shows. Is um, the the gray part is kind of the 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 modulation. So the white mm -hmm. part is the empty space. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see as our modulation goes down to zero, it pretty well rep, uh, reproduces the sine wave input that we were giving. So you end up with a much cleaner audio signal. That's right. Yep. Okay. And so this is the supervision and control board in the NX series transmitter. One of the things that I find just absolutely phenomenal after working on broadcast transmitters for years and years and years 
is the lack of adjustments that I see on this board. There's, there's not a potentiometer, there's not a variable capacitor or a variable inductor, and, and I can remember, Alex, making trips to a transmitter site because I had to use my little greeny screwdriver and make a slight adjustment, and sometimes I was climbing a mountain in the snow and to, to, to fix things, and, and this just, everything is still adjustable, it's just all in software and accessible through the AUI. Yeah, that's right. So, so yeah, yeah, wherever you are, you can basically make adjustments to the transmitter. And this will interface up to two digital exciters. They plug in here at the bottom side. You can see where they go in. And on the NX15, they're both standard, but on the NX3, uh, the second is optional. Yep. Okay. And uh, this is where all the audio inputs are, AES, EBU, plus analog left and right. And there's an optional GPS input card for frequency accuracy, for instance, for an SFN. Uh, there's still a parallel remote control and a full web server TCP IP control. So the, the AUI is coming from this card. Uh, right, in the NX3 it is. In the, in the NX15, we still have the 15-inch uh, touchscreen on it with right. um, the, the single board computer that's running the AUI. Yep. Okay. All right, and then this is the RF amplifier. So this is a 2,500 watt amplifier, and on the right-hand side over here is the RF amp. And these four sets of four screws there are the four 200 ampere FETs that are replaceable with just a screwdriver. Now, one could ask, do I really need 200 ampere FETs? for two and a half kilowatts? And the answer is obviously no. Um, so what I have heard is that the reason why you guys chose these FETs is that the on current or the on resistance of a FET is lower in a higher power FET. So not only is it more robust, but it improves the efficiency to have such high current FETs. Is that accurate? Yep, that's that's exactly right. Okay, and, and the bottom line of this design is that it is so over design that you can express, ex expect amazing robustness. Now, I have seen, um, and, and I'm talking out of school here, but I have walked down into the lab in the engineering room and I have seen this exact module sitting on a counter operating at like 12 kilowatts or even more uh, in CW mode, meaning to say in, in full on carrier, just solid carrier for hours on end. It's a design at a two and a half kilowatt module, but this thing will just sit there and run all day at far higher powers. That, what, 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 why did we do that? Uh, that? That was just a demonstration, I guess, of, of, of how over-designed uh, the, the RF amplifier side of the module is. So the, yeah. the heat sink and the FETs themselves are capable yeah. of running at those high continuous average powers, and it, it just kind of shows uh, the robustness of the design of the module. For years and years, Nautel solid-state transmitters have been known as being exceedingly robust, and I, I think this is probably part of the reason is this philosophy of designing the power amplifier to be um, uh, way over-designed. Mm -hmm. All right, on the left-hand side is the modulator, and there's three phases to the modulator on each module, and six phases overall, and all the drive for the RF and the three phases of PWM comes in the modulator input. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then the other thing we point out here is a Hall effect sensor, which is showing us the amount of current that's going through this H bridge of, uh, of transistors in class D uh, at, at, each, at each time instantaneously. Uh, right, and yeah, what that, that's primarily used for is short circuit protection, so that if yep. if one of the RF FETs uh, fails, then we we won't lose the modulator FETs. So the the power module manages itself and shuts itself off if it sees a high current condition. So in an older design, would, that might have been a fuse, and then you'd have to go out to the site and replace it. But now the right. the, the module is monitoring its current dynamically and then making changes as needed and very right. quickly. Probably faster than the fuse could blow up. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the thing schematically. So these are the three phases of PWM, and they are taking the B plus supply and passing it through to the uh, amplifier stage. Right, so they basically convert the 400 volts to the, the PA volts that we're looking for on the amplifier stage to get the power out of the transmitter that we're looking for. 
Now, a very critical part that determines the audio performance, both in, a, in an analog AM transmitter and in a digital AM transmitter, is the PWM filter that's right here, the modulator filter. But we've done things in the development of this transmitter uh, because of the multiphase and the high sampling rate that reduce the demands of that modulator filter and mean that the performance of this transmitter in digital mode and analog mode is better than it would normally be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, the purpose of the, the three uh, PDM phases is um, basically they, they're they not in phase, they're, they, there's a phase rotation between them, and that means that the harmonics of the PDM signal are canceled uh, up to right. the fifth harmonic in a transmitter. So wow. that allows us to extend the bandwidth of our modulator filter. We don't need as much roll-off to, to, um, to uh, filter out those harmonics and that uh, extends the bandwidth of the signals that we can get through the transmitter, for, and that means mainly for have, digital modes of operation. And that means that modulator filter has less impact on both a digital or an analog signal, either in terms of, of amplitude effects or group delay effects. Right. Yep, okay. Now let's talk about this H-bridge. One of the things is that we're driving these pairs uh, alternately under direct digital control of the modulator card and because we have that direct control of these 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 uh, opposite um, sets of transistors they are turned on and turned off at times and at periods when there's not voltage across the transistors right and that, and that's how, one of the ways that we uh, maximize the efficiency uh, of of the amplifier is by switching when when there is no voltage across the device so we minimize our switching losses and that's why we can get the kind of efficiency out of the transmitter we have. Right. Okay. And then this output here um, is actually part of the series combiner. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Is it? Yep. Okay. So we'll talk about that in a second. So that's what the thing looks like from the side. Again, no adjustments, no pots, no variable capacitors or inductors. And that also means that the module, the PA, is actually broadbanded for the entire AM band. There's no tuning of this transmitter. And the module is hot pluggable. Uh, there's heavy gold connectors on both sides, and as we mentioned before, the heat sink is very much oversized, um, and we're using a high-efficiency silicon carbide modulator diode and balanced RS-422 modulator and RF drive. That's what comes in the, the, uh, 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 the Ethernet jack on the front of the transmitter, or on the front of the module. Okay. Um, so let's talk about this, the way the drive works and, and you know, the traditional PWM is up here and here is our 1.8 mega samples per second six phase digital direct modulation. Uh, right, so, um, so I guess the idea here is that you can see that the, the, um, the modulating signal is being sampled uh, a lot more often with the, uh, with the six phase um, PDM modulation, um, mm -hmm. which gives us a lower quantization noise and better reproduction of of the of the signal that we're trying to transmit. Okay, very good. And then this is a series combiner. In essence, now in the in the NX15, it's a copper pipe, right? That's right. Yep. Yeah. And in, uh, this, in the lower power transmitters, it's 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 cores and Litz wire. Uh, yeah, so in, in the 15, there's still cores, and there's still four turns on those cores. The, the secondary is a copper pipe, whereas in the three, um, all, all the, both the primary and the secondary are uh, Litz wire windings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in essence, what is happening is you've got on one side of the, of the, of the wires here, we're, we're feeding the, the output network, and the other side is directly grounded. So uh, that's right. from the antenna directly to ground through the combiner. Right. Okay. Um, and then these are the output, these are the motherboards for the modules, and these relays, these black relays here, are the isolation relays that allow you to disconnect the module without causing any kind of problem. And between they and the fans that are in the transmitter, those are the only moving parts in the entire transmitter. Right, uh, plus the B plus discharge relay <laughs> in the there notes there. Yep. 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 Good. Now these are the output networks. So describe the process of of changing frequency of one of these transmitters in the field. So we retap the coils, and what else has to happen? 
Um, on the next page, you'll see the RF capacitors in the back. Uh, so you'll have mm -hmm. to change the values that are, that are in those capacitor banks. And we can give um, them a chart and explain what has to change. Yep. Um, and then from there, you just have to use an impedance analyzer to actually look at the impedance of the filter and tweak it up uh, to mm -hmm. what the ideal impedance is, and then um, calibrate the transmitter uh, at the new frequency. Very good. Okay. Now let's talk, this is one of my favorite slides. So this is where you hook up your antenna over here, and that's DC ground. And this is what's in between. So we've got all these RF amplifiers stacked on top of each other. Now in NX3, there's just two of them, and, and in, a, in NX15, there's 10 of them. Um, so let's look at what happens if I'm a lightning bolt, and I'm going to come down and hit this output point here. And I'm going to come in, and the very first thing I hit is this carbon ball gap. Now, the carbon ball gap can absorb a tremendous amount of power, but it's kind of slow to activate, correct? Uh, yeah, that's right. So it's just an air gap, uh, same thing that would be normally located on, on the antenna. So really, the antenna one is the first thing the, the lightning would encounter, but if anything makes it to the output of the transmitter, then we also have a ball gap there. Okay, and then here we have the forward and reflected directional coupler points for spectrum verification, but we're also taking another sample at this point, I believe, and yes. sending it back, and if that sample detects VSWR or any kind of VSWR discontinuity, which is typically how a lightning bolt is initially perceived, mm -hmm. it shuts off the B plus to all those amplifiers. Is that correct? Uh, it shuts off the RF drive, actually. To the the RF drive. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so we so have and, and if you look at this harmonic filter here, it is not only performing the, the, the tuning and the harmonic filtering, but it also represents time. It takes time for a signal to get from the output port through to the other side of the harmonic filter. And my understanding is that the reaction time of this sensor and being able to shut off the RF drive, we can actually shut off the RF drive before the discontinuity makes its way through the filter. Is that accurate? Exactly, yeah. The, the RF drive actually gets shut off uh, in less than one RF cycle um, at anywhere in the band. And I've heard it's in the nanoseconds. Yes, yeah, it's very yeah. fast. Okay, so then we have a static drain choke, and we have a series resonant high pass section. Now that's important because the power in a lightning bolt is contained typically around 100 kilohertz, I believe. Mm -hmm. So we shut off, we, we have a high pass section that passes the AM broadcast band starting at 550 or something, 530 kilohertz, and where it already has significant impedance to RF in the 100 kilohertz band. Yep, that's right. Exactly. Okay. Right down to right down to DC. It it blocks as much of the lightning energy as we can. Okay, and and provides not only blockage, but it it provides series impedance so that things that are happening downstream can do a better job of shutting it down. So this is just a, a third harmonic trap, mm -hmm. and then you've got a pi filter here. It looks like. Yep. And oh, in the pi filter um, is a pressurized tritium calibrated fast spark gap. So it has the capability of absorbing less number of joules of the lightning energy, but it can do it very quickly. Right, it's just very fast at it. Okay, so uh, again, the, the, the higher current stuff is closer to the antenna, the, or the higher power consumption is closer to the antenna but slower, and the faster stuff is not only further from the antenna, but it is it is surrounded by a series impedance and time that make it work even faster mm -hmm. and be more effective. And then it goes to the point here where it's just a straight wire to ground, basically. I mean, it's a it's either a copper pipe or a a pretty heavy duty uh, uh, conductor going to ground through a couple of cores. Exactly. Yeah, and and also the the PAO puts are transformer isolated, so there's not a direct path for the for the lower frequency or DC current to pass into the PAs. So now we're kind of explaining why the Nautel transmitters have such a reputation for being at least as impervious to lightning damage, properly designed, in a, in a properly designed transmitter site, as, as any tube type transmitters that are out there. And, and again, I should mention that if your lightning protection scheme in your transmitter site means the fastest path from the antenna to ground is through the transmitter, then you're probably still going to have problems. <laughs> but, but we've done everything in the design of the transmitter to minimize that. 
Okay, and then this is showing us some of this. this is that high, uh, this is that tritium uh, gap. Yep. And there's the ball, carbon ball gaps. Mm -hmm. And there is the uh, the lightning choke. Yep, static drain choke. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then this is the uh, the control board for the uh, uh, rectifier stack. Right. Yeah. And what we're saying there is basically the the input uh, rectifier uh, can adjust the uh, can adjust its level to to adjust for uh, variations in incoming AC voltage. So if there's surges on the line, you don't see the surges by the time it gets to the PA. Right. Okay. To a certain and there's extent. a big big hunk of iron in between the AC mains and the and those rectifiers. That's right. And there's a big advantage to having um, big transformers um, uh, in series with the AC in series with the AC line. So, um, and those are tappable, so you can set them up for the way you want them. And they're all three phase in the NX series. Okay. Uh, in terms of cooling, um, you've got two uh, ball bearing fans as opposed to roller bearing fans. Um, which gives very long life, nine years is typical, in trays. And we're actually monitoring the tachometer on those fans. Right, yeah, each power module monitors the tachometer on uh, its own fan so that if, if a fan fails, the, mod the module actually shuts itself off. When we talk about cooling, probably one of the things that if we were actually physically standing in front of a transmitter today that was in full operation, um, regardless of the power of the transmitter, really, you could put your hand over the top of these things, and there's very little temperature rise from ambient mm -hmm. air through the transmitter. Yeah, that's right, and that's that's because of the high efficiency of the transmitter. Exactly. Okay. And then you've got these low voltage power supplies which provide power to the exciters and the controllers, etc. Right. Yep. Okay. And that's showing how all that is inside the transmitter. And the, 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 the filter that comes off the power transformer is a choke input filter. I believe that's one of those chokes there. Yep, that's one of the chokes. And then the, the four big uh, blue capacitors there are the, the capacitors in the filter. Right. Okay, and then overall, the NX15 is 84% efficient and the NX3 is 82% efficient. And these numbers are typical and they're AC in to RF out. Right? Yep, that's correct. Okay. <laughs> All right. And this shows how the family works. It's, it's incredible to me that at the 100 kilowatt level and higher, we're actually 90% or more efficient uh, AC into RF out. That's just unheard of. I've, I've never run into a transmitter that was 90% efficient. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty high number. It's a pretty good number. We're pretty proud of that number. And on top of that is something called Modulation Dependent Carrier Level, or MDCL, uh, which is basically a technology that uh, acknowledges the fact that in an AM transmitter, the carrier really has no value, except that it sounds like duck quacking if you don't have it. So, so it, it basically it ducks the carrier when it's not needed to whatever level uh, it can get away with. And by doing so, it has no effect on the coverage or the performance or the signal to noise ratio, but it can give you up to 30% of additional savings beyond the savings of the efficiency of the transmitter itself in electrical costs. Now, other companies will charge you up to $5,000 for that option. We include MDCL and all of the various different algorithms uh, at no charge. It's built right into the transmitter. You just select it, and we'll show you when we get to the, uh, the demonstration of it. That's a huge, huge benefit. I don't think people realize they may be astounded by these efficiency numbers, particularly as you compare it against the typical 60% efficiency, for instance, or less of a plate modulated type of transmitter. Uh, but then you'd add this MDCL on top of it, and it's just amazing. Uh, there's a whole bunch of advanced capabilities we're going to get into here. Um, uh, give a quick look at this, all of this, but it's all there um, and built into the transfer. We're going to go through it in some detail. So there's over 6,000 AUI equipped transmitters worldwide. Um, they range from the NX series to the NT series of UHF television transmitters, the GV series, the NV light series, the NV series, and the VS series, 
all of them share the same AUI. Now, they don't work exactly the same because, for instance, what you would put on the screen in a television transmitter or an N or a FM transmitter it may be different than what we would want mostly on an AM transmitter. However, if you know how to use one, you probably know how to use them all. So now let's switch, if you don't mind, we will switch to the AUI that is currently uh, installed in the the uh, technical lab downstairs and uh, so does that look okay on your screen there Alex? Oh uh, yeah, that looks great. Okay. So this is an NX3 operating as you can see up here at 3 kilowatts. On the left side here in the upper spectrum or what we call the tools area, the upper left tool is the spectrum analyzer and it's a real spectrum analyzer if I click in and 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 look at it I can click on a particular point now we are 11.7 kilohertz above the carrier frequency and the amplitude at that point is minus 87 dB rough numbers and you can see also this blue line is actually the mask so this is the mask for an AM station as defined by the FCC. Are there other masks that are available in the setup of this for, for other systems around the world, Alex? Uh, yes, we, we have masks for uh, IBOC and uh, DRM modes of operation as well. Okay, very good. Um, so that's the, the, the spectrum analyzer, and you can actually um, you know, use it as uh, a complete spectrum analyzer. I see a little spur here, apparently, uh, which is... Um, Let's see if I can figure out maybe 18 kilohertz or so. Uh, no, 90 kilohertz above the carrier, but that's not really there in the RF output. Uh, right. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, we we have some spurs that show up on on the spectrum analyzer that aren't necessarily on the output, but um, this one right. is obviously not a problem because it's below minus 80 dB. Yeah, minus 88 dB as I see here on the on the screen here. Yeah. All right, so let's put that back, put the tool away, and then let's look at another one that's very cool here. This is the Smith chart. I'm going to take that up. So it's really a network analyzer that's working in real time with modulation uh, as we speak uh, in the transmitter. And I can even zoom in further and see. And you can see that red line is the actual performance. So if I go here, that's... 5.75 kilohertz above the carrier frequency, and that's the impedance at that frequency. And if I come down here to the middle, that's what it is, uh, pretty close to the carrier frequency. And then down here is minus that same value on the uh, on the negative side of the carrier frequency. And you can see the impedance for each one of these points. Now I'm going to share a story with you, Alex. <laughs> Years ago, I was in Hong Kong. For a, for a broadcast agent show, and there was a young, or an older, I should say, an older fellow that came up to me, and he asked for a demonstration of the transmitter, and I was walking through this Smith chart, and the fellow started to cry, right in front <laughs> of me, he started to cry, really, and I said, I said, what have I done, Why, how, did I offend you in some fashion, he says, no, he says, do you know how many nights I could have spent with my wife instead of standing there with a deep <laughs> side of the transmitter site? Yeah. <laughs> And wow. I, can, I understand that. I've done. I've been through that myself, and I, I get that. But this is very valuable because there are sites where you question how 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 is my antenna working at this point in time, and does it change with wet ground and dry ground and all that kind of stuff. So, I, I get that, and it's really an amazing tool. When I think of what we had to use, we had graph paper and plotting and. And, yeah. uh, and and oh gosh, and we were off the air. You know, this is just doing it from your the, from your house. Um, yeah, that's great. You, know, you can even do it on your cell phone. Crazy. Yeah. Okay, so these uh, are the inputs here. Go ahead. I was just going to mention uh, to some people the impedance might look a little funny, but it's normalized to one ohm. So you just kind of multiply by, that by fifty ohms to s right. understand what the yeah, impedance sort of is. Yeah. Input. Yeah. Yep. And and the, the the other value of this is in some modes, uh, particularly DRM and HD, the rotation of the cusp or, or the direction that that's oriented is very important. And it's also very easy for you to see with this, and it's being measured at exactly the place you want to see it, which is just where the amplifiers are at the output of the at the output of the P uh, of the of the combiner itself. Exactly. So you don't have to compensate for the phase rotation through the filter of the transmitter. 
So to optimize your station for, for digital, and act, actually, interestingly enough, analog sounds better too if you optimize it this way, but, yeah. but uh, you can just very easily see how much phase rotation you might need in order to get uh, optimal operation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we've got a, a box up here at the upper right, which is uh, called audio input. So this is actually the audio input levels coming in through various different sources. Yep, that's right. So right now, um, the active sources are the ES1 input and the XGen IQ input. So you can see what the okay. levels are coming in on this. And then down below that is something that looks similar to that, but not exactly. This is modulation levels. Can you contrast right. what that means? Um, well, modulation, so this is actually uh, your envelope modulation that's going on the output, and the envelope magnitude actually shows um, w what percentage of the transmitter's peak power that you're actually making use of. Okay, so this, on the left side here at the top bar, that'd be, uh, that'd be cut off, that'd be 100% negative. That's all right. the way to the left, and then on the right is 140 percent positive, and right now we're averaging somewhere about 115, 118, 120 percent looks like. Mm -hmm. And then the green area is the RMS modulation. There's a ton of data here that's available to you. Yes. Now let's do something just for fun, and and just to make everybody uh, shocked and amazed, or shock and awe, I guess is the right phrase. Um, let's change modes. So right now we're in analog, and now we're just going to switch over to HD radio. And you've got the equipment hooked up, and we'll you'll notice here on the spectrum analyzer that the mask changed and now you can see the HD radio sidebands on either side. It was just that simple. I didn't even turn the transmitter off. I just flipped it from one mode to the other and now we're in HD radio mode. Yep. And we've and still got our analog just like normal, but we now have the digital sidebands. That's right. And you can see the cost a little bit better on the on the Smith chart now. Yep. And now let me do this. I'm going to switch off and I'm going to go to a single constellation. And then I'm going to full screen that. And now this is basically looking at the demodulated signal as OFDM. And if I yep. switch to primary carrier, you can see there's uh, looks like looks like 16 carriers per quadrant. Right. So this is a 64 qualm signal on the prim primary right. carriers. And the tightness, that is how much they resemble they resemble dots as opposed to blobs gives us the MER. I mean, that just, you can look at it, you can say, okay, this is a very clean signal. Uh, let's put that away and, and change that. Now I want to show you some of the other meters that can go into that response. This is the EQ frequency response. So we talked about the PWM filter. This is basically the effect of the PWM filter. Is that right? Uh, yes. So this is the, this is the compensation that's being um, applied for the, for that PWM filter. So that's why okay. the gain is increasing as you increase in frequency. Sure. And you can see here that we're good out to more than 70 kilohertz. Right. Exactly. Okay. All right. And we'll close that. And then we'll open up another one here. Impulse response. So we're actually modif... We're, 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 you know, there's a... There's a uh, there's a measure in the field for, for audiophiles called TIM, T-I-M, the transient intermodulational distortion, and it basically talks about how well a, a, an amplifier will respond to instantaneous changes, and this is uh, how we're correcting for that to make it respond perfectly? Mm -hmm. Yep. In essence? Basically. Okay. Okay. And then... Uh, the EQ filter delay. So this would be the effect of group delay that is in the filter on the audio. And you can see there's almost no effect of group delay within the audio pass band. It's only when you get way out here to 70 kilohertz or more that yes. you see any changes going on. That's basically the okay. end of the filter that's in there that you're seeing. Right. Okay. And then AM to AM correction. So this is what's fixing the um, PWM nipple or PDM nipple. Exactly. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, so the gain, yeah, goes way up as you go as you go down in um, in signal level. Right. So this is what uh, you know, we're we're making sure that the the as we approach a hundred percent, we are still accurately reflecting the audio input that's being fed to the transmitter. Right. Okay. And let's see what else there is here. AM to PM correction. Now, this is an interesting one. Back in the day, um, we used to talk about 
um, the phase modulation of an AM transmitter, um, and it related to AM stereo. This was something you had to be very careful of when you were trying to make a transmitter pass an AM stereo proof. Right. And now we're, we're correcting for it built into the transmitter, and that's no longer an issue. Exactly, yeah, because it's also a very important uh, measure for, um, uh, for transmitting digital signals as well. Of course. Okay. Um, and so the list is you. That's not going to be appropriate in IBOC. And so we pretty well, let's look at this power distribution. Want to explain what this is, Alex? Um, so this uh, basically displays the probability of exceeding a particular peak power level. Um, so okay. it, it allows you uh, to, uh, to see if your transmitter is, is clipping or not based on um, the power that, or, or the signal that's being transmitted. Okay, so this one is saying at 6 dB approximately below 100% on, the probability is that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's right. So okay. that's how often the signal that's being transmitted is, is hitting that power level. Very good. Now let's, let's go change the mode and let's cross the Atlantic and let's go to DRM. Now we're going to be in digital radio mondial mode and now if I take that full screen we're now transmitting a DRM signal. And again you can see the mask clearance uh, under the mask is really phenomenal. Yep, we usually so, get uh, about 5 dB clearance um, okay. at, the, at the minimum point. Yep, that's great. Okay, I'm going to go back to analog for a moment. And then I want to show one more fun stuff here in the troops. We put it back on Spectrum Analyzer. We'll take this one back to Smith Chart. And now I'll go over here to presets. I want to show under analog settings some cool settings here. So right now your audio source is an AES signal and you're looking at the left channel of it and broadcasting in mono and the filter type is a brick wall but there's choices. Um, and we have an NRSC1 preemphasis which we can enable or disable. This is where you would enable dynamic carrier control and there's the five different algorithms that are supported within the transmitter. And if I turned that on, you would see the average power of the transmitter would fall, but the actual coverage in the, in the area because all the power is contained in the sidebands would remain the same. Mm. An AMSS is some sort of, uh, it's like an RDS for AM, isn't that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's a AM signal signaling system is what it stands for, and it transmits a, a small amount of data through through the phase information okay. uh, in the carrier phase modulation. Now, our experience with with uh, radio systems or radio station systems today is that the least reliable part, the Achilles heel, if you will, of an AM station or an FM station, for that matter. Is, is, is now the, the STL. It's not the transmitter itself because they are redundant and digital or, or uh, uh, and, uh, fully uh, solid state. But they're also, then the studios are redundant and solid state. And so the, the least reliable part of a, of a station is oftentimes the STL. So we have this audio loss timeout capability and we can go in here and tell what to happen. We can change a preset at any time an audio loss is detected. So we define what an audio loss, which would be a number of minutes and seconds and a particular threshold, and then we would choose a different preset. So I could set up a preset with a different audio input, for instance, and it would automatically switch. Or, um, you know, for instance, since the transmitter, well, we'll go into that. It, the transmitter can also uh, take in a number of other, what I would call non-traditional audio inputs, and, and switch to those, and even create its program within its own um, uh, system. In fact, let's show that. So this is the audio player, and the audio player can be set up with playlists on a USB drive, and you can have a number of WAV files or, or uh, 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 MP3 files, and you can create a playlist, and it'll automatically play that playlist on the air. The cool thing about it is it can automatically switch over to this just in case you lose your STO or you get a brown out at the radio station or something. And on streams, this is where I would add a shoutcast or ice cast stream or set it up for live wire if we were doing live wire. Um, the, the, the cool thing about the streams is that 
most stations today are webcasting, and they're using either IceCast or Shoutcast. So if your STL should fail, you can program in the URL of your Shoutcast or IceCast stream, and the transmitter can go out onto the web through the Ethernet that you connected and can pull up that stream and put it on the air automatically for you and, and keep you on the air. Probably not with the very best of audio quality, depending on how well you shoutcast or icecast, but better than being off the air. So uh, logging is also supported in the transmitter. You can see I've got 351 events in the log. And if I here's a cool thing. If I go to Log Manager and I hit the button Copy Logs, now on my PC, my clipboard has all of those logs, and if I open up an Excel file or a Word file and paste it into that, um, then it, my log is automatically completely formatted and dropped into those devices, and uh, I've done it all remotely. I didn't have to be located at the transmitter site. So more cool stuff. We can also, in this transmitter, configure it. I think this is under User Settings. We can configure it to send you an email, or we can configure it to send you uh, an SMS even um, via, uh, and, and you, can be def you can define the, the events which would cause that email or that SMS. So for instance, if you have high VSWR, uh, you can send an email or an SMS to one person. But if you have low signal level from the studio, you can de de define an email or an SMS sent to a different person. We also have in the transmitter the ability to do certain things at certain times based on a scheduler. So we can come into this schedule and set up a rule. So from between this date and that date on these time on these days, between this time and this time, we can change to something else. So think about, um, for instance, each month you have to go to low power in the evening, and if the time changes, you can configure all that up in the rule explorer. And you can have program an entire year in advance, and it'll automatically change power for you. Um, and in order to make that work, it's important that the time be accurate. So we've actually got NTP servers configured into the transmitter, and we can um, let the transmitter synchronize itself to NTP automatically by using this. So the transmitter will keep itself uh, synchronized to time. Did I miss anything important on this, or should we go back to the PowerPoint? No, I think that covers it. Okay, I'm going to do my due diligence and shut the transmitter off so that we don't waste a lot of power. <laughs> and I'm going to switch over here and switch back to our PowerPoint webinar. There, the slideshow. And I'm going to close this. And now I should be able to continue with power. So we, we talked about live wire inside, and it's available on the NX3, uh, not yet on the 15. And there's, uh, you know, this is audio over IP technology. So LiveWire is basically a digital interconnection standard using Ethernet for studios. And it was developed by the Axia group, part of the Telos Omnia Axia family. And uh, it's now supported by many companies. And the Nautel transmitters, I believe, are the only LiveWire equipped transmitters in the world. And this applies also to our FM transmitters. And there's the shoutcast and icecast input. So if you're doing uh, streaming, that becomes a backup for the transmitter just in case your STL were to fail. This is how the playlist editor works. You can have up to about 500 files in a playlist. And uh, you can even upload new content and change the playlist remotely. So if you have a brownout at your studios and you're operating from home and you need to update a weather forecast, you can do that and just upload a new, con new content to the USB to port. Again, these transmitters are completely digitally radio compatible. You may not need it today, but who knows over the life of the transmitter uh, whether or not you're going to want to do digital, either DRM or HD radio. And uh, Nautel is right out in front uh, maximizing the performance of transmitters under digital. Um, and in fact, uh, for instance, in DRM, we are using the advanced simul mode, so we're, it's capable here, we're demonstrating, of doing simulcast. Now, that may not be easy to do in the receivers, but the transmitter can do it. So there's your analog signal there with the adjacent DRM signal. It's all coming out of one transmitter. Over here is a 20 kilohertz wide DRM signal. That's, that's an amazing signal. Very wide. Again, may not be uh, compatible with all receivers, and certainly you have to have some attention to your antenna system if you want to do that. But nevertheless, 
uh, the Noctowl transmitter is, uh, is future-proof in that regard. And the tests that have been done on HD radio in all digital form, that is where the analog is actually turned off, have utilized the Nautel transmitters, and we're very proud to say that the NX series transmitters perform very well in the all digital uh, HD radio tests. And again, we talked about the MER instrumentation, which is included. It allows you to see really what's going on uh, in, your, in your HD radio signal. There's no test equipment available in the marketplace that does that. This is built right into the Nautel transmitter. and didn't cost you a penny anymore. Now let's talk about how easy it is to install these. You've had some, uh, a lot of conversations with customers over the years, Alex, and, and uh, they've told you what they liked and didn't like. And so explain the things that you've done here to, to make it easier to install the NX3. Sure, yeah. So on the NX3, um, uh, one of the things we've done is we've just put uh, integrated the ferrite uh, that goes on the AC input uh, cabling into the transmitter, so you don't have to do anything there other than run your wires through it. Mm -hmm. um, we've also um, <clears throat> integrated a pallet into the bottom of the transmitter um, and added the ability to install casters um, so that you can e easily lift the transmitter off the, off the pallet that it comes on and then move it wherever you move it into place basically. okay um, and then for the NX3 we also ship the transmitter with the transformer installed so there's no heavy lifting required for installing that transmitter awesome awesome and then on the 15 similarly so the 15 uh, the transformers obviously a lot bigger um, so that sure. does ship separately um, but we do supply a wheel kit that allows it to be easily rolled in into the transmitter when the transmitter is in place mm -hmm. um, we also have a, a, a channel and a terminal block uh, provided for uh, easy AC connection um, and there's wires that go from that terminal block to the transformer, so you don't have to worry about connecting directly to the transformer. Great. Um, and then there's also the local 19-inch touchscreen uh, where you have full AUI control locally of the NX15. Okay, very good. And let's see here. Um, as always, we have a, a four-year warranty on these transmitters, and we have customer service facilities in uh, Quincy, Bangor, and Halifax, as well as Parts Depot in Memphis, Tennessee, and and Quincy, Bangor, or and and, and Bangor and Halifax. We have live support 24/7, 365. We have live chat, and uh, we've never discontinued the support of any product that Nautel ever made. You can press that with our with our esteemed competition. We also have Nautel Phone Home uh, built into the NX3 and 15. Think of this as proactive customer support. The transmitter, should you enable it, it's turned off by default, but if you enable it, it'll send uh, occasional packets back to a database at Nautel and over a period of time, if you should call up and say, I've got a problem with my transmitter, our customer service engineers can look at that database and determine what's been going on with the transmitter. And in some cases, it actually will tell us that you have a problem before you know you have a problem. And that's pretty impressive. Okay. Uh, continuing on. And so the summary is that these are proven, efficient, compact, advanced, with advanced control and capabilities and digital. Uh, very efficient. Uh, the, the line goes from the new 3 kilowatt all the way up to and including 2 megawatts. We didn't have enough room on this slide to include the 2 megawatt, but that <laughs> is a doable thing and, and we're very excited about that power level. And now we have an opportunity to go in here and answer your questions. So, um, uh, there's a gentleman, Marco, is saying, I am running my transmitter in analog. What are the differences between the all uh, the dynamic carrier control options? Um, there are just a few different algorithms, I guess, that have been developed over the years. Uh, some of them work better uh, depending on uh, what kind of... Uh, what kind of... Programming? Programming you're using, that's right. So yep. whether it's, it's music or it's uh, talk, um, you, you would use different algorithms for different ones. And these programs, and these, these algorithms have basically developed in, um, in Europe uh, over the years uh, for, for high power AM, long wave, and short wave in Europe. And each of them has their benefits. Um, that's why we put all of them in there. Most of American broadcasters are using AMC, I believe. Yeah, that, that, I, th I think so, and um, I was also going to say that even if you're running IBOC, we've shown that you can successfully use uh, AMC with IBOC signals as well. Okay, great. 
Um, that's that's very important. Um, and I think that's pretty much uh, the end of the questions, and we've pretty much run out of time. So with that, I'm going to say, here are some places you can find some additional information online. Uh, please check out our YouTube channel. This webinar, if you want to share it with your friends, is available or will be in the next hour or two on YouTube. Uh, you can check us out on uh, uh, on uh, YouTube, you can check us out on LinkedIn, you can check us out on Facebook, we're everywhere. And uh, meanwhile, if there are other questions, you can talk to the uh, Nautel sales staff. Um, and uh, we're a great bunch of folks and been around for 47 years and, and uh, love this industry. So that's it for uh, uh, for me. Anything more for you, Alex? Uh, no, I think that's that's it. So for Alex Morash, I'm Chuck Kelly, thanking you for joining us today. If you have more questions, send us an email at thesales at nautel.com. And uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye for now.